Hello, and welcome to the October edition of Spotlight Tampa. I'm Steve Overton. Thanks for joining us today. First in the spotlight, for the past two months, we've followed Spotlight's Abby Feely along the Tampa Riverwalk, and this time, Abby takes us to the newest addition to this waterfront destination. At the north end of the river is the newest addition to the Riverwalk, Waterworks Park. Located at mile marker 2.2, this park truly is a jewel on the water. Waterworks Park is located in Tampa Heights, the city's oldest neighborhood. It is also the site of Ulele Spring. Once the source of Tampa's drinking water, machinery in a nearby water department building pumped the spring's water throughout the city. For nearly a decade, this park went unused before a renovation project under the Buckhorn administration brought it and Ulele Spring back to life. Throughout the year, parents and their kids pour into the park for a refreshing way to cool down. Not only do dogs have it made in the shade here because of the sizable tree canopy that covered the dog park, but all of the park's visitors find a pleasant escape from the hot Florida sun in the fabulous trees at Waterworks Park. Although fairly new, this park hosts a great number of events and festivals. In addition, a memorial garden honoring Clara Fry and Blanche Armwood, two of Tampa's iconic women, was built into the park's landscape. And now we have the river walk, and uh, to me, it's the best place to run, best place to be, best place, great, greatest place to meditate, and best time to spend with my family. Richard Gonsmart is a lifelong resident of Tampa and a well-known restaurateur. When he heard about the redevelopment of Waterworks Park, he began to envision a unique investment in Tampa's future. When I was in Canada, in Montreal, and Vancouver, and saw all day how, how they'd renovate these beautiful um, buildings into restaurants. And, and so when I found out that the old Waterworks pump station number three was available, I said that my prayers were answered. And I was uh, determined and, and destined to make this a restaurant that people from our community and visiting Tampa could enjoy. No doubt, the food is fantastic, but there have been other benefits beyond a satisfied palate. The Waterworks Building Restoration Project created over 600 jobs, including the employment of local artists. Students from four schools near the park are given the opportunity to learn about a rewarding career in the hospitality industry. We're going to make a difference. This is more than a restaurant to me. This is about restoring the pride and self-esteem in this once great and once again vibrant Tampa Heights. This was the last in our series on the Tampa Riverwalk, but you can watch more of Abby's tour right here on City of Tampa Television in a special program entitled Discovering Tampa's Downtown Waterfront. You can also catch it on the City of Tampa's YouTube channel. We are right in the midst of Hispanic Heritage Awareness Month, but what being Hispanic means depends upon where you come from. For the past few years, a local couple has brought together people from backgrounds as diverse as Puerto Rico, Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, and Honduras to celebrate a rich blend of cultures. In 2014, former City of Tampa Parks and Recreation Manager Nilo Menendez was tasked with developing an event aimed at Tampa's Hispanic community. There's a lot of history in Tampa and Tampa Bay for, uh, based on uh, Hispanics and the foundation of Ybor City and West Tampa and Tampa in general. And the population was growing, but the community events weren't growing with the same pace. And the equality of the events needed to be stepped up to meet the needs of the community. Menendez found allies in husband and wife team Alex Cora and Maritza Astrokiza, the owners of a local audiovisual company. So Nilo came to us to see if we would put one on, uh, what we thought about it, a one-time event for about a thousand people, and we just said yes, that we would try it, we would do it. They decided to hold the event at Al Lopez Park and that it would be free and open to the public. The event really started out to be Festival Caliente. And it was named between the three of us. We put all that together, all that vision together. We expected it to be a one-time event for 1,000 people, 20,000 came. After the first event, 
we received such beautiful comments and people took to the airwaves and were thanking the city of Tampa and were thanking the police department. And the number one compliment was the quality of the event and people felt that that was being respectful to the community. After the second year, we decided to change the name to something a little bit more unique and we came up with Conga Caliente. I have to say that from the very first day from that time at the park when we were sort of just thinking about this, Alex stated that he wanted to make sure that this event was an event that would attract families, that it would allow families to come together and enjoy their Hispanic heritage, and that it would be open to other people who were non-Hispanic as well. Conga Caliente has been a labor of love family, friends in the community, and sponsors and media, everybody coming together has really made this special. And we really have turned out a quality event, a quality event that the community deserves, I believe. You can see Conga Caliente for yourself. The fun will take place on November 1st at Al Lopez Park. Visit congacaliente.com for more information. Last month, we told you about the Florida Conservation and Technology Center, a partnership between Tampa Electric Company, the Florida Aquarium, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that's focused on education, conservation, recreation, and eco-friendly technology. This month, we turn to the Florida Aquarium to tell us more about some of the exciting work taking place at one of the coral greenhouses at the Center for Conservation, as well as what visitors have to look forward to in the near future. The way that we've designed the site, uh, it does have a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, the Manatee Viewing Center, which is right up the road, is where the, the, the heart of it will start. You know, that's open six months out of the year. It's free to the public to come in and, and view the manatees. And so we ask the question, you know, how can we get those people even a uh, greater exposure to what we have going on here in Florida? And the visitor experience down here will, will work on a lot of different levels. Those individuals that are interested in just coming and experiencing Florida will be able to come out, rent a kayak, go out and explore the mangroves, um, and just come down here into a, a place that is, you know, it, it's out away from everything, um, and, and really experience it for themselves. Uh, for the educational side, uh, the school kids will be able to come down and actually have of, um, you know, lesson plans that will tie back into what they're learning about in the classroom, but they're going to learn about it within the environment, which, you know, every educational study shows that that's really how kids retain things. The Florida Aquarium partnered with Tico Energy and the Florida Fish and Wildlife, and without that partnership, um, none of this would be possible. The great thing is, is that between the three partners, we all bring something unique to the table. Uh, Tico was generous enough to provide the land for us um, and is also going to be featuring sustainable energy sources here on site. Florida Fish and Wildlife is, is bringing their expertise in the local environment as well as uh, the ability to stock animals here. So the idea is that they'll have a snook or a redfish nursery here and they'll be able to reintroduce those animals right out here in the bay. And then the Florida Aquarium brings the, uh, the knowledge of being able to take care of animals um, within uh, an environment like this. As a consortium of institutions, we all wanted to give back to the environment. And the concept behind it was, what can we do to impact wild populations? We have the, the greenhouse. Uh, when we build the rehab center, we're gonna have places where the public can come and actually interact and view our, uh, our rehabilitation center, our veterinary center that we're building down here. Um, and they're going to be able to have that, that, that interaction with the people who are on the ground doing the actual research. And the best news about all of it is that it will be absolutely free to anybody who wants to come down and experience it.
The coral greenhouse that we're standing in right now uh, is being used to take corals uh, and take those animals and really work with them to unlock the, the answers to the questions of how they reproduce in the wild. Uh, we're working with researchers from the University of Florida to help answer those questions, uh, as well as taking spawn and bringing it into the lab, in other words, baby corals, and trying to get them to grow up here. One of the problems with the specific species that we're working with in the wild, staghorn coral, is that there's so little of it when it spawns in the wild, two different uh, groups of coral aren't even close enough for the spawn to fertilize with each other, which is what you need. So what we're trying to do is essentially be the middleman and get those two groups of spawn together, bring them into the lab, grow them up, get them to spawn again in the lab, and then take those new colonies and reintroduce them into the wild. The other thing that we're doing here, which a lot of people don't think of, is that they usually think of coral as either an isolated animal or, or, or the, the, the structure for the larger ecosystem. But there's other animals that play a very important role in making sure that coral is healthy in the wild. And one of those animals is a type of long-spined sea urchin. Back in the 80s, their populations were decimated by a disease. And because of that, the coral reefs have started to become overgrown with algae. And so what we're trying to do is spawn them here in the greenhouse and take those little baby urchins and reintroduce them back out to the reef to get rid of all the algae that's, that, the, the, that the coral is, is having a difficult time with. Right now, our education center is, is, is being built, um, and that education center is going to be designed to serve as school children that come down here. The next building that, that we're building is our sea turtle rehabilitation center. That building will allow us to rehabilitate up to 50 sea turtles at a time um, and give us the ability to do things with them, like give them deep water um, to make sure that they can swim and forage for themselves before being released back out in the wild. Every species of sea turtle is either threatened or endangered. And especially here in Tampa Bay, but also all around the world, they're what we consider a keystone species. So if you can monitor that species, that gives you a very good indication of how the larger environment is doing. So one of the advantages of being situated right here on Tampa Bay is that if we have researchers that want to go out and monitor the wild populations, there's a boat ramp right here, a boat, and they can, within you know a half an hour of deciding hey we want to go check out some sea turtles go out and actually look at them uh, in their natural environment as a part of a larger consortium of AZA institutions you know we touch over 180 million people a year and if we can take the message of actual work that's being done in the field and be able to translate that to all of our visitors that come through the door that's a very powerful message and so this site in particular is the next evolution Evolution of that to be able to take the small-scale conservation efforts that we've been doing and really take them to the next level. As you can see, much of the Center for Conservation is currently under construction. Stay tuned to CTTV for more updates as the project nears completion. Tampa Fire Rescue trains constantly to ensure that when the call comes in, your Tampa firefighters are up to the challenge. One of the most dramatic training scenarios takes place at Tampa International Airport. Let's take a look at the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Training, ARF for short.
crews from St. Petersburg Clearwater International and Sarasota Bradenton Airports will travel to TIA to participate in this training. Kudos to the pros at Tampa Fire Rescue for their professionalism. Automated garbage and recycling collection with rolling carts has improved trash removal tremendously in the city of Tampa. But as Spotlight's Lori Van Bemden reports, there are a few simple things you can do to keep your carts in tip-top shape. Today I'd like to talk to you about a few easy things you can do to help maintain your cart and provide successful service, especially during the rainy season. Here in the city of Tampa, we provide each resident with both a garbage cart and a recycling cart. Each cart should have a lid that fits tight, two wheels, and a center bar. Don't be this cart on the block when you could be one of these. Should you have any damage to your cart, wheels, or missing the center bar, please call us at 813-274-8811. Due to the nature of our work, our vehicles are washed multiple times per week. The frequent cleaning allows us to provide safe and sanitary collection services to your neighborhood. If you're familiar with our Florida summer weather, then you know we can receive measurable portions of rainfall throughout the day. If the lid of your city issued garbage or recycling cart is left open, it can store up to 10 gallons of water throughout the day. Here are a few simple things you can do to maintain the pristine conditions of our neighborhood. Always close the lid of your garbage or recycling cart so no rainwater can get inside. Periodically clean your garbage cart to avoid residue and foul odors. If possible, store your carts under a shelter or cover or inside of your garage. At the Department of Solid Waste and Environmental Program Management, our mission is to enhance the quality of life within our community while providing industry-leading collection, disposal, and environmental services. Remember, during the rainy season, to close your lid and pull your cart under cover or in the garage, so together we can maintain carts and provide successful service. For Spotlight Tampa, I'm Lori Van Bemden. Keep these tips in mind, and if you have any questions, please call the City of Tampa Customer Service Center at 813-274-8811. Stay with us. There's much more Spotlight to come right after the break. Every day we go about our lives driven by routine and blindfolded to the realities of the world around us. Our vision is clouded by the very normalcy we take for granted. Countless victims of human trafficking walk among us, seemingly invisible. Until now. The Blue Campaign provides a unified voice for those who oppose the heinous crime of human trafficking. Whether it's forced labor, domestic servitude, or the sex trade, it's time we open our eyes. Sorry, I didn't even see you. No one ever does. Learn what you can do to help by visiting dhs.gov slash blue campaign. Have you noticed the increase in colorful wildflowers throughout Florida? Thanks to sales of the state wildflower license plate, many important projects have taken root. Planting along highways and within communities, educating homeowners about the benefits of native landscaping, nourishing the pollinators that make other crops possible, and researching new ways to protect Florida's unique environment. With the state wildflower license plate, you can help add beauty and color to Florida. Welcome back to Spotlight Tampa. I'm Steve Overton. Tampa is a great place to ride your bike. Nice weather most of the time, very few hills. Some employers are starting to make riding to work easy, safe, and fun for their employees. Spotlight's Christina Costa tells us more. Karen Kress is the Director of Transportation and Urban Planning at the Downtown Tampa Partnership and she learned about the bicycle friendly business concept a few years ago and really thought it would be a great fit for Tampa. Downtown Tampa surprisingly is a great place to ride a bicycle which might be a little counterintuitive because there's 
a lot of traffic and activity around, but that's exactly precisely the reason why it does make sense to bike downtown because drivers are expecting to see people, they're expecting to stop frequently. Um, we have opportunities to get away from cars, for instance, along the river walk, it can get you from one end of downtown to the other. Um, or we have on-street um, bike lanes, and then sometimes streets are actually just kind of calm enough that you can just be right out there in the lane of traffic. So as a way to kind of bring attention to that, draw attention to the fact that it is a very bikeable place, um, one great way to uh, recognize that is through a bicycle-friendly business program. This is something that hadn't been done in Tampa before, so we were able to make a big splash with our first phase. So we thankfully had a great partner in the Florida Department of Transportation who, who identified the need for this and was able to give us a little bit of funding for me to hire uh, a woman named Christina Costa with Pedal Power Promoters to go out there and really pound the pavement. And we weren't sure what to expect with our first phase, but as I, as I noted, it, it was really successful. And uh, we are already working on phase two, and we have a phase three plan. So expect more great things from Tampa. Our main interest is in this was really economic development and community building and when you are on the seat of your bicycle you know seeing seeing your city from 10 miles an hour is a completely different experience so we really want people we want to give people you know a safe environment to come out and be biking by a store and say I never noticed that before and just hop off their bike they don't have to deal with finding a car a Park, you know, place to park their car and just, you know, just walk into a business. So we were able to identify those businesses who really wanted to kind of go above and beyond to attract those, those uh, people who are interested in seeing their city that way. And we, were able, we ended up, I think, 29 locally designated bike-friendly businesses. Tampa General Hospital is a 1,000-bed teaching hospital in downtown Tampa with over 7,000 employees. TGH is an economic powerhouse in the city, the region, and the state, and is the only hospital in Florida to be certified silver as a bicycle-friendly business by the League of American Bicyclists. Kim Christine is the employee wellness manager at Tampa General Hospital, and she did a great job securing the award from the League of American Bicyclists. In the employee wellness team here, we are always looking for ways to help our employees to be healthier and happier and more productive. One of the things that we know about our um, employees is that many of them would like to bike to work, some of them do, but that sometimes it's a little bit difficult with some of the infrastructure we have or getting here. Um, so we were actually looking for ways to make biking a little bit more friendly here at Tampa General. So what we've done so far is we've created a number of access points for our employees so that when they get to work with their bikes, they have a nice safe place to park it. We also have other bike racks across the campus and at our corporate center. We're going to be building a new bike rack there for our corporate center employees. Our employees are our most important assets. We want them to be healthy. We know that there's a link between happy employees, healthy employees, productive employees, and the bottom line business results that come from that. And so I would tell employers it's really important to, to try and reach out for opportunities like this for your employees. Jessica Cohen lives close enough to the hospital to bike to work and she is one of the many individuals at Tampa General that has volunteered to be a bicycle ambassador and mentor to form bicycle clubs and coach others on riding their bike to work. I've been riding almost two years in October. It's really convenient, you feel healthy. It's kind of my therapy after a long day. I get to be outside. I ride on Bayshore a little bit, so I get some of that nice view of the water. Um, I get great parking. I don't spend nearly as much money on gas. I don't put miles on my lease car. Um, so lots of good benefits. Always wear your helmet. And in the mornings, it's dark when I ride, so I make sure I have good lighting. I've uh, front light, back light, I even have some tire ones that when I feel like it's getting really dark in the early hours, I'll throw those on too. So be visible and be safe. When you're downtown in Tampa on your bike, look for this designation. These are businesses that have a special offering for you and want you as their customer. If you want to learn more about the Bicycle Friendly Business Program, contact me at 813-263-4785. I'm Christina Costa for Spotlight Tampa. Stay tuned to Spotlight Tampa for all the latest on cycling in our fair city. We'll keep you up to date on new bike lanes, festivals, and much more. 
University of South Florida College of Public Health researchers were recently awarded a National Institutes of Health grant. The researchers hope to identify optimal drug candidates that could ultimately lead to a fast-acting treatment for rare but deadly infections caused by microscopic free-living amoeba commonly found in warm freshwater lakes and rivers and in soil. We're here today at USF Health where Dr. Dennis Kyle and his team are working hard to find a treatment for the dangerous amoeba that's lurking in our Florida waters. Take a look. Well, the problem is we have these free-living amoebae that are out in the environment. They're pretty much everywhere in the water and the soil. And a very small fraction of those can cause human disease. And that's what we're working on. What's unfortunate is when these get in the right environment, maybe get up uh, your nose while you're swimming, playing around in water, or using it to cleanse, then they can go through the nose up into the brain and actually cause a fatal infection. This happens actually just in a few days. After you're exposed, you start getting symptoms that may be like bacterial meningitis. It's often misdiagnosed as that. A few days later, coma and followed by death. And almost always we find the amoeba just before or just after the person is either expiring or already in a coma and it's too late. Where do you find these amoeba? They're in the braining amoeba called Megleria phalari is only freshwater. It does not survive in salt water. Where we find it most often is in water, anywhere in the water. So it's not only in the soil, so you can stir it up as you're, as you're swimming, but we've actually, this is one of my PhD projects, I found it actually in the water column as well. So it's also in soil. So you could theoretically get this in multiple ways, uh, exposed to this fresh water. The other amoeba that can cause disease are not this acute fatal disease like I just described for Negleria phalari. They're known as acanthamoeba and balamuthia. Normally those are more of a chronic disease, but they can end up in being a fatal disease as well. The warm water places around the world is where we mostly see it, but if you look just at the United States, most of the diseases actually happened in Florida and Texas by far. There's only about 135 cases that have been documented in the U.S. since the early 1960s but 34 to 35 of those have happened in Florida. Another 34 or five have happened in Texas. So yes, we, we do have to be worried about this in Florida. What we really need for this disease is a new drug that works quickly. As I mentioned, the disease happens so quickly and it's often misdiagnosed early. So by the time it's diagnosed, the person's almost expired or about to expire. So the real need right now is a drug that will work quickly. Awareness of this amoeba is actually critical and you can see in some of the protocols in hospitals around here that they've actively changed the way that they look at these cases. They ac actually start asking now, has there been freshwater exposure in the last week? Because usually we see a history of this freshwater exposure within about four to five days before the onset of symptoms. So awareness of physicians and, and, and those in the hospitals to diagnose this is really important. We're hoping that the drugs that we're discovering for the acute disease caused by Negleria would also be useful for these more chronic diseases that still have a very difficult outcome. How do you prevent your, uh, your child or yourself from getting this disease? It's really important uh, and there's an active campaign now called Amoeba Awareness that some of the families of these victims are promoting. And it's very simple. The, the, the theme is it's 99% fatal, but it's 100% preventable if you, if you know about it and either your child keeps the head out of the water or you use nose plugs. And just know that if you're in a warm water environment in Florida and fresh water, the chances are very high that that amoeba is going to be in the water. We don't like to talk about this as being a rare disease because really these amoeba are so prevalent that we're getting exposed to them all the time. And the, the problem is that if somebody gets it, the impact is usually 
very high because it's a fatal disease. So to work on this amoeba, we have to follow very strict biosafety protocols. We certainly have been fortunate at USF. We have special equipment, special ways of handling this, and highly trained personnel, because working on a pathogen like this, we have to be very careful. But it's really important that we found to be able to, to discover a drug. We have to work with the real pathogen. We can't work with some of the, the non-pathogenic brothers and sisters of this. Uh, we think we would miss a lot of things that, that we would catch by using the real pathogen. A few years ago, put in an application for the National Institutes of Health and we got the, the first grant that I know of to actually work on this for amoeba. And we found compounds already in the first, the first two years of the project, we found candidate compounds that are already 500 times better than any of the approved drugs. And so now we're working in a new grant that just started to actually take those and actually try to turn those into drugs in the next few years. The past academic year's research totals are up from over $428 million in 2013-14, ranked 43rd among both public and private universities in research nationwide. USF is also a global leader in producing new U.S. patents for inventions. USF ranked first in Florida, 10th in the U.S., and 13th worldwide among universities in securing utility patents for new technology, and has ranked in the top 15 worldwide for the past five years. Well, it's October, and that means it's time for an all-new Zubu, and this time it's just for kids. Ideal for younger boys and ghouls, age 11 and under, Zubu Kids is a Halloween treat. I'm Rachel Nelson reporting for Spotlight. We're at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo to preview an all-new Halloween experience known as Zubu Kids. Designed for a younger audience, Zubu Kids is a daytime Halloween celebration with a whimsical twist, candy bats and scaredy cats. On select days this fall, little boys and ghouls can go batty with trick-or-treating, crazy mazes, not-so-scary story time, and kooky, not-spooky character appearances. Children are invited to come in costume and have a howling good time with up-close critter encounters and barnyard animal parades. Plus, watch some of the zoo's animals receive pumpkins and other seasonal treats. Parents get a sweet deal too. Zubu Kids activities are included with daytime zoo admission. The fright free fun starts at 1 p.m. with extended zoo hours until 7 p.m. on event days. Visit LowryParkZoo.org for details. We love it! Look for these colorful umbrellas for a sweet surprise. Trick or treat stations. Zubu Kids is a happier Halloween experience, and it's only at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo. For Spotlight Tampa, I'm Rachel Nelson. And just remember, Zubu Kids activities are included with paid zoo admission or zoo membership. Visit LowryParkZoo.org slash Zubu Kids for details. That wraps it up for the October edition of Spotlight Tampa. I'm Steve Overton, and for all of us here at CTTV, I hope you have a great day. We leave you today with a look at Mayor Bob Buckhorn's recent visit to McFarland Park Elementary School's Government Studies Program. Enjoy. So how many of you want to grow up and be the mayor someday? How many of you know what a mayor does? What is um, a mayor um, <coughs> um, does by um, helping um, by get, ma make a city a better place. Oh, that's right. Did everyone hear him? He says the mayor, the mayor works to help make a city a better place. And do you know why I do it? <laughs> to make a better city for all of you? Um, how do you encourage the citizens to help the environment? That's a great, great question. We do as much as we can to make sure everyone knows how important the environment is. We have to protect the earth. And so we encourage people by doing things like cleanups. And we have all kinds of groups of, of children and other organizations uh, that will help us do cleanups. So it's important that we take care of this earth that we live on. 
Exactly. Now, are you guys going to help me get up when I have to get up? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Totally. 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 Because I may need some help getting up because my, my knees don't work nearly as well as they used to. So, yes. And guess if I got stuck here, then who would run the city if I was stuck? I would be. Oh, you guys would? I would, I would, I would, I would, I would you see why I love being the mayor? <laughs> I wonder if that's the president calling. What do you think? Yeah.